I'm uh, Simon Pascal Klein talking about web friendly type. Thanks. Uh, thank you. So, I'll give a really quick tiny introduction to who I am. Um, I'm one of those wanky Bachelor of Arts students uh, when I'm not working, which I'm not at the moment. Um, I'm a designer, mostly graphic and web. And incurably, I'm a typophile, so I'm a type nerd. Um, so basically, we're uber, geek, uber geeks who love type. Uh, are there any of you here? <laughs> awesome, cool. So I really like to start with definitions, um, just to make sure we're all on an even sort of plane, and then we'll get straight into it. Um, the other thing I should note, this talk is a monster talk, like it's massive. Um, I will only be giving really a second part of the talk. Uh, the talk is roughly divided into two parts, and because I want to focus on some Drupal stuff, um, I just don't have time. There are like 122 slides, so, and most of them are text. So, I'm only doing the second part. But I'm going to be putting the entirety of the slides online. So if there's stuff in the first part, which you'll get introduced to, that you find interesting, you can go online and grab the PDF. So, typography is quite simply the art of creating and setting type, and with the, with the purpose of honouring the text that you're setting. Um, so, I said we're going to be, it's a bit faded, but roughly two parts. The first part of the talk is dedicated to getting a typeface on the web, and the second part is setting that type all nice and pretty. Um, I'm going to be only glossing over the bits in the first part, because many of them are, unless you're highly technical and doing stuff entirely by yourself and not using plugins or existing frameworks. Um, a lot of it can be really technical, so I'm just going to gloss over it because I presume many of you here are Drupal users, um, and I want to focus on that. So part one, and I'm just going to gloss through the start of this, and then I'm going to be skipping straight to part two. Why do we bother doing this? Um, well, I suppose the internet is completely saturated with lots of information, uh, and much of it is textual and a lot of it's a real pain to read. Um, man, how many of you have used Control Plus to up the font size just because you can't read something? Yeah, all the time. And ideally, we don't want to force users to do that. We want to provide something that's legible and readable and accessible to begin with. So that's really what, where typography at least comes in from sort of a utilitarian perspective. But it's of, of course also for aesthetic perspectives or uh, purposes to make things nice and pretty. So typography can bring aesthetic order uh, to information, to whatever you're presenting online, and helps users read and navigate. Um, I presume lots of you, who here has gone on the internet and looked up typography stuff online over the last year or two? Awesome, yeah. So there's been a really big renewed interest in typography over the last few years. Um, typography is essential to aesthetics, um, really, really central to accessibility, legibility, readability. Um, and many of the sort of finer points, the kind of stuff that's come out over the last few years has given a lot of websites fame uh, online in you know, showcases and galleries simply because they've done something really, really new and cool with type. Uh, and of course, finally, there's been the growing availability of web fonts over the last yeah, two years or so that has allowed us to sort of extend beyond the traditional you know, uh, web core fonts, say fonts that we have. And I suppose, finally, it just makes stuff pretty, which is awesome. So uh, finally, I guess the bottom line is that web experiences that have really good typography are just easier and more pleasurable to use. So you can, use, you can look at typography from an aesthetic perspective, but it's also really essential to things like usability. Um, let's cover a few assumptions. I guess the first one is it sucks and it's boring, which it's totally not, by the way. Um, the next one is there's been this long-running sort of assumption that type on the web is just limited to sans serif for, uh, for readability, simply because we're working with a rasterized display and things get pixelated and therefore you know, the serifs, the intricate parts of type are really difficult to read. But it's not quite true. The other one is that we're only limited to web safe fonts, so things like Arial, Times New Roman, that we can't really extend beyond those, but also not quite true. Uh, there's limited control is the other assumption, that if we want to do anything really cool, we have to resort to non-standard technologies which used to be the case, but no longer. And finally, I guess the other big assumption, and to a certain extent this is correct, there are so many options, where do I start, what do I do? So, yeah, not quite. Yay. Um, so there are some possible problems and pitfalls that I just want to quickly cover, and then I'll get into how you get type on the web. More fonts does not 
in equal instant uh, typography. Uh, just because there's a whole bunch of new web fonts available doesn't mean that they're necessarily suitable for the web or that it makes things better. Many of the fonts, um, this is an extension of that, are actually optimized for web use. Many of the fonts that have recently been available via at FontFace or from Foundries to be used online were designed for print and were never properly hinted for web use. Um, again, part of the growing availability of fonts and differences in, in implementation. So this sort of uh, open source versus closed struggle, you know, trying to retain copyright and stop people from copying fonts easily just because you're serving them on a web page for your, for your web page, so they can't copy them down and then use them in you know, Photoshop or in design or something like that. And I guess the final one, um, which I probably won't have time to cover today simply because the Drupal plugins manage all this, um, something called subsetting and compression becomes your responsibility if you're hosting your own uh, things and not using a hosting service. So how do we get stuff on the web? Um, the answer is there's a whole range of different options uh, for putting type on the web, and they vary in complexity and stylistic versatility. The nice thing is they're standards-based, and you can use them right now, which is awesome. So I'll quickly cover through this, and this is almost the end of the first part of the talk, and then I'll skip straight into the second part. So the, the, the options that you have for setting type on the web, first off is the installed fonts that come on the user agent that a user is using to access your web page. So these are considered mostly web-safe fonts. The next option that kind of floats, and these are sort of slightly in chronological order, uh, is the scalable, scalable Inman Flash uh, replacement technology or other JavaScript and Flash replacement technologies, which, are, which you shouldn't use anymore. Kufon then came around, and which basically, uh, actually I won't cover the technical details because it's deprecated and you shouldn't be using it. Then came web fonts, uh, which is the web at font face CSS declaration has actually been around since CSS 2.0, I think. So it's been around for like almost like eight years or nine years now. Um, and then you can use various different uh, formats. So one of them is EOT. The other one is OTF, TTF. Then you have WAF, which is more recent edition, which is the uh, web open font format. And then there's also SVG, Scalable Vector Graphics. And finally, which kind of makes your life a lot easier, there are hosting and licensing servers that take care of all of that stuff for you. Now, if you're using Drupal, at Font Your Face, which is the module that you guys should be using if you want to put in custom fonts into your Drupal web pages. It's nice and simple. And you can find it on drupal.org slash project slash font your face. And like all other Drupal modules, it's incredibly easy to, easy to install. So that is the first part of the talk. I'm going to be skipping straight. Oh, what I will sh briefly show you is the kind of things that you should expect if you're using a hosting and licensing service, which you would be if you're using, well, actually, I'll cover quickly. The, uh, the at font your face plugin allows you to manage fonts that you upload yourself but it also allows you to manage fonts through existing hosting and licensing services like Typekit or Kernest uh, and many of the others that are out there. So the way that these hosting and licensing services, they're generally foundry initiatives, so people who actively make fonts. Uh, and what you do is you create an account, you, like you sign up, you select a payment plan if you're paying for typefaces or fonts for use. Um, you grab code off them, you inject it into the page that you're using, and that's what the plugin manages for you. So there's a few things to worth. So it's currently really conceived the solution um, because in many cases, foundries were really against the idea that you could just upload a TTF because anyone could just download it and therefore not pay for the work that they've, and the hundreds of man hours that can go into making a good font. Um, many of the solutions that they come up with are standards based, which is awesome. Um, and all the nitty gritty compression subsetting crap that's really technical is all managed by them because it's in their interest to cut down the load on their servers. So that's really cool. So this is just an example of everything on here except for like this screenshot here and I think like you know that sign up button. Everything else is all text. So this the easiest uh, way to use real fonts, that's actual plain text that just has an awesome font loaded onto it. And this page renders, is standards based and renders in IE and Firefox and all the major other browsers. So I'll just go through a couple of examples. This is the, these screenshots I think are a tiny bit dated, but this is like you've logged into Typekit and you're going through some of the different fonts on, on offer that are available. So you can select which weights and styles. So if you want bold, italic, and if you're not using the bold, um, the service provider will not force your users to load the bold of that typeface, which makes, no, which makes good sense because it reduces load. 
So this is another page, entirely text, basically, except for the photo of, um, oh, what's his name? I keep forgetting. Uh, yes, Andy Clark. Um, so except for that, everything else is CSS and, uh, and yeah, CSS and basic plain text. No, I think the f sort of floral background might be an image as well, but everything else is pretty much text. Um, this is another example of the pixels, creativity, and lorem ipsum. That's just plain text. So you can actually select it, copy it, paste it, that sort of stuff. Uh, then there's font deck, which is made by a friend, an awesome guy who I know um, in the UK, uh, and his gang. And this is from Tybertech, which is a foundry in the Netherlands, um, who also offer a service. And this is sort of, you know, you, you select what you want, uh, and then you pay for it, and you get to use that forever or for that time that you're paying for. So that's what that plugin for Drupal manages. It does all this stuff for you. And this is just more examples of just awesome type done on the web with that font face. It's just all CSS, pretty much. So anyway, um, I will skip now to part two. Part two. So, meanwhile, um, web fonts are not the holy grail of all the problems that we have online. Or, as Jeff Croft says, typography is not picking a cool font. <laughs> uh, also, I suppose the thing to remember is that, like I said, a lot of the fonts that are now available were never actually meant to be used online, so they might render really poorly, especially on like lower resolution screens. So, I presume you've now selected the font that you want to use, either you're using Arial or Times New Roman or something really basic, or you're using something that you have access and licensing rights to and have put online, uh, or you know, you've, you've logged into Typekit and using the at font your face, uh, sorry, at font your face um, plugin for Drupal, and you've selected the typeface you want to use. The next part is styling it. Yeah, intermission. So I'm going to quickly demo. Sorry, that's for tool fans out there. Um, I'm going to quickly demo the Typography plugin. The second plugin you guys should be using is, oh yeah, this is the at font your face page. Is, if I can find it, Typography. There we go. Um, Typography is essentially just a bunch of scripts. Uh, it was first made for Django. Uh, it's been ported to WordPress. Um, and now is available for Drupal as well. Um, what it basically allows you to do, it does a whole bunch of you know, the basics of prettying up a web page for you. Uh, and the way it does that is it wraps various characters with additional tags that then you can call upon in your style sheet for your Drupal theme to style in various ways. Um, the way you install it is really simple. You basically just download it, stick it onto your web server, or use the um, Drupal administration panel and install it. So if I were to, this is just a test instance. So if you go to modules, let that load. It's somewhere down the page, so I'll just search for it. Basically, you install it, you click Enable, and that's it. And the only final thing you need to do is you need to zip into Configuration, and then Content, oh, where was it? Here we go, Content Authoring Text Formats, this one here. And the final thing you need to do is you need to add that plugin to the various text for, uh, formats that you have. So for example, if you're using filtered HTML, you just click configure, you skip down to here, and then you add typography and make sure it's enabled. Uh, and then finally, what you can do is you can fine tune the settings. So these are all the things that typography does for you. First one is typography, like proper quotation marks. So rather than having dumb quotes, it'll put proper quotation marks in for you automatically. Uh, you can ask it to you know, convert a double dash into M dashes or N dashes, so proper punctuation that you should be using. It might wrap ampersands for you, so you can target ampersands and style them in italics, and I'll cover all this in a second. It does ligatures for you. It does arrows, so for example, the dash and then the greater than or less than will automatically convert to the correct arrows that you want. So this is what Typography does for you, so I, I highly recommend installing it. Um, and again, it's available for many things beyond Drupal. So you're not limited to having to use this with Drupal. Let's continue. Intermission is now done. Oh, yeah, and it's on project slash typography. So if you just Google it, you'll find it instantly. 
So I want to cover now the sort of more aesthetic nitty gritty stuff. You've, I presume you've installed these two plugins, but you want to make things prettier. First off, let's cover families or font families. So there are serifs, there are sans serif families. Note the lack of the little feet, which are the serifs. There is script, which comes from handwriting. There is black letter, which technically comes from handwriting as well. This is uh, the sort of uh, type of handwriting that was commonplace in Europe around 1450, when Gutenberg invented movable type. And finally, in the digital world, there is monospace, where every single character occupies, the, every single glyph occupies the same amount of space uh, horizontally. So, what we have to, what you're probably quite familiar with are these fonts. These are readily available and installed on most user agents, which means that if you want to style your text in one of these, the font file will be uh, taken from that local computer and will be used to render that. But of course, we can extend upon this. Um, the first recommendation is use a limited palette of typefaces. Just because you can use 50 fonts on your web page does not mean you should, is the basic premise. A common technique is to pair things together. So for example, one might set your body and the other one might set your headings. So you might use uh, you know, uh, a sans serif for your block of text and all your headings will be in a, in a serif. Um, one might be setting the primary content, the other one the user interface controls. So for example, all your content in your web app might be you know, in serif and your user interface controls, log in, log out, you know, all these sort of operations, they might be set in sans serif. And the nice thing about that is it easily, instantly tells the user to be able to differentiate the two types of content on the page. Um, and we do this with the font family property. So I'll skip through this because this is just basic CSS. Um, font weight controls your weight and accepts, like you can just look all this stuff up in a CSS uh, tutorial or reference material. Uh, font style controls the style. So for example, normal, italic or oblique, and they're not the same, I'll cover that in a second. Finally, you have font variant, which gives you normal or small capitals, and I'll cover that as well. So the various font styles that we have is we have Roman, or normal, I suppose. Uh, then we have italic, which is not the same as oblique. Oblique is a digitized italic, which means it's slanted. Um, you can notice the italic here is distinctly different to the Roman above it, because it actually has sort of markers that come from handwriting is where the character starts and then ends. So there's sort of like the tick on the eye here where the hand would start, come down, and then switch back over. Uh, an oblique is slanted uh, by the computer. So not quite the same. Or a dirty man's italic, as it's also known. You have different weights. So this is uh, Helvetica Ultralight, regular and bold. And then finally, you can mix the two together, as some typefaces might have. If you have, like, for example, a bold italic that's condensed. It all depends on the font you're using and how much uh, whoever designed it, made, or how many features are available within that font. And then finally we have small capitals, which are uh, reduced in size to match the X height of, in this case you can't see it, you'll see it on the subsequent slides, uh, the X height, which is the height of uh, lowercase characters, comes typically from the X or lowercase X. Um, the differences being is that the width or the stroke of the letters will be the same width as capitals, so they're not like squished optically, op like automatically by a computer. And we have tracking, which is horizontal spacing between uh, the letter pairs, and it's done, it's not, not the same as kerning. Kerning is what happens uh, when whoever designs the typeface and releases it. Tracking is the additional spacing you as a designer are adding afterwards. So you can have sort of loose tracking or tighter tracking. In CSS, it's called letter spacing. Uh, there is a particular, so there's also word spacing, by the way, uh, and you can use the two together if you deem so. There is a particular trend of negative tracking using something like Helvetica Bold. This has been around for the last few years. Everyone seems to love doing this. So you can see that in action, how it might work. People love using this for headings in particular. Why do we bother doing this? Well, it can really help differentiate some stuff and actually improve readability by removing some disruption. So one classical example is when you're doing setting acronyms or numerical data. Um, I guess I'll have an example. So for full capital acronyms, it can really disturb the flow of the text. Imagine you're reading a paragraph and suddenly you have HTTP or NASA or UCMP or something like that, a big acronym that's in full capitals and it really sticks and stands out. So the example here is, you know, 
you've got two acronyms, you've got NASA and HTML, and they just really stick out. So what we do is we will set them in small capitals. Now, and I've got some numbers here as well, which are the same height as all the lowercase um, letters that have no ascenders or descenders. So what we do is we set it in small capitals, like that. And the other thing we do is if we're setting numbers within a paragraph of text, we want to set them in old style so that the numbers dip below and above the X height and the baseline to match all the other letters. I mean, the G here goes below. So in this case, you see the tail of the nine skips below, the four skips below, the top of the six skips up. So it looks less blocky and doesn't stand out quite so much. So letter spacing and word spacing is the CSS that you want to be using. Um, they take uh, numerical and normal numbers, or values rather. Um, sadly, there is no CSS um, uh, ability to, ta or to target um, figure variants. For, so for example, at the moment, if you have uh, a bunch of numbers, you can't change whether or not they're old style or whether they're all uniform in height which is really annoying. It's coming as a proposed property in CSS3, if I believe correctly. Um, at the moment, Georgia is the only, ex like the only web safe font that has uh, old style numbers in them automatically. Uh, so if you're going to be setting lots of, like, if you're gonna have lots of strings of numbers in lots of text, then use Georgia as a, as a general guideline. So sizing is the next, oh, actually, yeah. The other one that's really big on the web is, um, Links. Links automatically will have an underline, and the problem with underlines is that it can cut through descender glyphs. So what will happen is it will cut through things like the bottom of the P and the G, and at really small sizes, it can really blur that and make it really hard to, to read. So one of the tricks is to use border bottom and put a pixel of padding. Um, at first, when I first started doing this, it was really odd, but I very quickly got used to it. And when I asked, for example, my mother, who doesn't have really good eyesight, she found that so much more easy to read, especially when you consider this will be quite small on a web page. Next, stick things to a scale. Don't just set type arbitrarily. There are a bunch of different scales. The classic one is this. It starts at, if I can read it, six. You can look, Google it online. If you type in typographic scale classic, you'll find it instantly. So there's a whole variant of different scales. That's just another scale, and you can, whatever suits you, you can use one on the Fibonacci sequence. But it's just important that you don't just go like, oh, well, okay, I'll make my body 12 pixels, and I'll make my headings 14, and just arbitrarily set things in various sizes. Generally use a scale. It gives you consistency as well, which is awesome. So we do this with font size. Um, numerical and descriptive values again. Uh, the big problem here is that most user agents will set the default size at 16 pixels. This can be really, really problematic uh, for the following reasons. Uh, what we should be doing is we should be sizing fonts not in pixels, but relatively in M's or percentages. Um, an M is a really kind of quirky concept to explain. Um, I guess the best way to see it is it's, it's a relative unit that it's kind of like a box around the glyph. Um, and it's rel relative to the point size of whatever you're setting at. So it sounds really confusing, but use it. And I guess the only thing I can say is start setting things in M's and it will just click. <laughs> so why do we bother doing this? Um, like I said, uh, yeah, so the b base is 16 pixels. Um, why do we set things in M's? Mainly because, or in relative, so you could use percentages as well if you wanted to. Uh, it's because font size, oh, some user agents don't support font resizing. Most of the modern ones these days do, which is awesome. Um, so for example, Internet Explorer 6 is notorious for not being able to change font size if it's set in pixels, which means if you give a web page that's in IE6 to a user with font, with font sizes set in pixels in absolute terms, the, and they can't read it, they will mash their control plus button and nothing will happen. And of course, JavaScript-based text resize widgets do not, ex uh, do not equal accessibility as per WCAG 1 and 2 guidelines. So you can't rely on JavaScript to give you, web access or to give you text accessibility. And um, be really careful when you make assumptions about the kind of devices that people will be coming to your website on. So be careful. So how do we size? Um, the important thing to remember is that font sizes are inherited within the DOM stack. 
so parents to children. So if you have a HTML element and then a body element beneath that, if you've given a size to the HTML element, it will stack downwards. So to calculate what one pixel is in M's, which is the easiest way to approach this, is you find out what one pixel is in M's, and then you multiply it by whatever you want for your subsequent stacks. So one divided by whatever the parent font size is, multiplied by the required pixel value. Uh, and there's a really cool trick, uh, which Richard Rutter popularized. So consider this scenario. You have a paragraph, styling for a paragraph element at font size 80%, and you have a block quote element. If you're setting a bunch of paragraphs, if you have a bunch of paragraphs you want to quote from someone, you should be setting them nested within a block quote. So what happens is 80% of 16 pixels, which is sort of the default that most user agents have, is 12.8. But if you have p tags nested within a block quote, it'll be 80% of that. So you get down to 10.42. And this can be really, really annoying. So one thing to make your calculations a lot easier is there's an article that Richard Rutter wrote where he outlined this trick, which is if we consider the fact that browsers have a common font size of 16 pixels, we can therefore set the body to 62.5% and everything gets reset to 10 pixels and therefore all your calculations are so much easier. <laughs> yeah. Yes? Um, so the question was, um, if you've reset everything to 10 pixels, yes. Well, I guess the assumption I'm making is you should be sizing everything. And the, it, it seems really daunting at first, like, uh, great, I'm designing a website. Wait, I have to set the font size for every single element I'm using? Well, yes, you should be doing that because it gives you consistency, which means that you override any other defaults that the browser might have and you set the right sizes that, that you want. So next up. Um, oh, by the way, to make this so much easier, there's a bunch of web, there's a bunch of um, plugins that allows you to find the actual size in pixels that something is rendered at. So use those. There's uh, the web development plugin, and there's one for Chrome as well. And I think Safari has an inbuilt one these days as well. And I think there are IE development tools as well. So no matter what browser you're working with, there are um, awesome plugins that allow you to do that will make all your calculations so much easier. Um, mixing typefaces. So I said I'd get back to X heights. This is your X height. This one here, down here, is the baseline. That's where everything sits on. And this here is the X height. In this case, the X height is tuned for this here. So Helvetica at 96 points. The X height is the distance between the baseline to the top of the X. When you're mixing typefaces, there can be problems. We have Times New Roman here, which is at 96 points, but optically not the same height as Helvetica. So what you do is you have to actually bump up and gradually bump up until you find when the X heights match if you're setting Helvetica and Times New Roman in the same paragraph, which you might, depending on what you're doing. Um, furthermore, when you're mixing things, there's a whole bunch of other problems that can occur. So you've, you've aligned the X heights, what do you do now? The next thing to, to figure out whether or not the two fonts that you're mixing into the same page or the same paragraph or whatever, if they're sort of compatible with each other, is to look at stroke modulation Angles, axes, serifs, and apertures. So, first one is, these are your angles. These are your serifs. In this case, we, we intend to mix a serif and a sans serif together, so we can kind of ignore the fact that Helvetica has no serifs. And then finally, you have apertures as well, which is the openings on, let, on letters or glyphs that have openings. And this is the second example. And you should be looking at the italic and the bold as well, because your, your regular or your, your Roman might match, but your italic might be completely off. Cool. So next up, um, the negative space is another thing that's worth considering. And it's really easy to do when you sort of superimpose them on top of each other. This is your negative space, by the way. So you look at the counters closed and open and you can superimpose glyphs onto each other to kind of get a feel for how similar they are, how similar they're not are. And you should be doing this at various weights and sizes. So consider the italic as well. So um, let's have a look at some more examples. We've aligned the X heights here so that 
the height of the A matches the height of the A in Futura, but you can notice that Futura, we've, we've aligned the X heights, which is what we should be doing, but Futura is so much fatter than Helvetica is. So mixing the two together is probably not a good idea. And you can see it again here. So uh, when you're mixing typefaces together, you have so many things to consider, like you know, does the strokes match, does the angles match, is one typeface so much fatter than the other that even though I've optically upped it to match the X height, it still looks really weird. So let's have a look at differences. We can notice that, uh, and style. Uh, yep, okay, so. Sorry, what am I doing? Go back. So uh, the other thing I wanted to show here, and it'll come up more in the subsequent slides, is uh, just purely differences in style. So both of these are sans serif typefaces. You have Helvetica and Century Gothic. But you can see that Century Gothic is much more geometric than Helvetica is. And you can get geometric sort of serif typefaces. So you have to look at the stylistic aspects beyond things like thickness, stroke, how high they are. Just purely the shape of the letters themselves might conflict. And that's the second example bottom. And then we'll get more style. And so let's have a look at actual combinations. So for example, we, wanna, we, wanna, we might want to add Palatino for you know, the body or the main text, your paragraphs, and we might want to use Futura as headings. Are these two compatible? Well, and that's the second example. Well, they're not really because the first one, the one on the left, Palatino is a humanist typeface. There are various classifications. If you look them up, there's a page on Wikipedia on them. There's a whole bunch of them. Um, this all goes into like type history. Um, a humanist typeface is one that sort of comes out of the humanist era, and many of them are sort of related to handwriting. Futura is geometric. It has nothing to do with handwriting. So these two are fairly incompatible. Vedana, however, is a humanist sans serif. So pairing Palatino and Vedana is a good idea. So further things to consider. That all done, let's get back to more basic things, glyphs. These are not quotation marks. As Jeff Croft once also said, whoops, this is a bunch of words surrounded by a bunch of tick marks, and this is a quotation. So these are the things we should be using when we're not talking about hours and minutes. Um, and furthermore, there's a whole bunch of other things we should consider. There's hyphens, there's n dashes, m dashes, even the minus sign is different, is a different character to a dash, to a hyphen, sorry. So there's a whole bunch of them, and there are HTML entities for them. So closing single quote is write single quote. But you don't want to remember all of these because this is really, really hard and difficult. So when you're doing something a lot, you automate it. Um, and this is where Typographier, the plugin, steps in. It has Smarty Pants as a script included in it and does all this stuff for you. So they're basically passes that convert your ASCII text into proper typographic smart entities, and it goes beyond the punctuation as well, which is awesome. So Smarty Pants is available in PHP, Perl, Movable Type. There's Typography, Python, Django, Drupal. There's the WordPress plugin as well that manages this stuff for you, and there's even um, passes for things like Textile and Markdown, which is awesome. Next up, we give ampersands love. So a lot of the ampersands that we have can be look really boring, especially if you have them in a heading or a title. One of the things we can do is we can make them prettier by just accessing their italic variants. So just these are literally the italic variants of each of those fonts. And they look much prettier. So if you imagine setting a heading, take the italic. Have everything else in, in, in regular or bold or something, and then just italicize the ampersand. Marking paragraphs, more than just putting a blank space in between your paragraphs. You can mark your paragraphs in a whole bunch of different ways. Some of them might be more unconventional these days, but so you can just put indents, outdents. You can put a white line, which is a spare line between each of the paragraphs. A pilcro, which is something that used to be done. I don't remember when it came out of when it fell out of fashion, but uh, I have a couple of books on my bookshelf where every single paragraph starts with a pilcro. Uh, you can use other ornamental. Um, uh, ornaments like uh, those florons, versals, headers, whatever, um, and a combination thereof. There are some great example pages. If you go to tinyurl.com slash para-typography, um, you can see some examples of various ways of doing paragraphs. How much time do I have left, by the way? About five minutes. Awesome. 
Next up, measures. Uh, this is the length of a single line. Um, it's really important to not just do this arbitrarily again. Uh, you set measures in CSS using the width property, and these should ideally be relative to the font size. For what reason? Well, if you bump up the font size, because it's not legible at whatever size, what will happen is the paragraph will expand relative, the width of the paragraph will expand relative to the font size that you have, rather than you know, you press up, 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 and suddenly you have three words per line, which is really unreadable because then your eye is doing this. So yes, we should, uh, oh, so the web generally um, does really well from slightly smaller measures than in print. So a good Paul Park is about 10, 15 words per line, and yeah, that's about yeah, 70 to 100 characters. Um, this is sort of subjective. I know some people within the type community that 10, 15, like 75 to 100 characters per line is way too much. They prefer like a max of 50, so test. Um, and furthermore, um, ideally use text align left uh, for running text. Um, justification can work, which is, does everyone know what justification is? Yes, awesome, cool. Um, can work with some fonts um, and better with serifs generally. Um, simply because serifs, the entire idea of a serif typeface, all the little feet, are essentially guidelines for your eye to follow. So when a P comes down and folds out with a the little serif, that is a guide for your eye to follow that baseline. So your eye doesn't skip to the line below it. Letting, which is controlled by the line height property. Um, we need to provide an ample, let, ample letting for all the paragraphs we're setting. You do this with line height. And the really awesome thing is you can set a unitless, lump, uh, unitless number. So um, rather than saying my font is, you know, renders at 12 pixels, I'm going to set a letting at 18 pixels, which is really not the way you should be doing it. You use a multiplier, 1.5. So it will multiply whatever the font size you actually have, which is awesome. So one less thing you have to worry about, actually a unit of some kind about, which is good. So letting spans from one baseline to the next. So that's an example. So you've got one baseline, and then that's the letting for that. Um, this is sort of experimental. Um, I will briefly cover it. Hang punctuation basically means that things like bullets, lists, parentheses, all this sort of stuff, it all hangs in the margin. So an example here would be this. Good books will do this. Um, it's really difficult to do consistently on the web at the moment. There is, if I remember correctly, a um, CSS3 property in the works that will cover this stuff, but it's still really experimental. You can do it with lists. And a lot of people have been doing it recently by just setting the margins to zero. Um, and you can do it for opening quotation marks by using a negative text indent or a background image, for example, if you wanted to. And there's another example of that. Um, that is the proposed property uh, specification, the hanging punctuation property. Finally, the last few things to cover is text. Treat text as the part of the user interface. You're not serving a book. You're serving an accessible interface where hyperlinks, you can click on them and do things with them. So it's really important to treat your text as part of the user interface. You can do this with color, you can do it with underlines, indent, outdents, all these sort of things. So I suppose one example, and I've been fishing around for ages, I need to replace the example, but this was a really simple project management system that um, a bunch of friends and I and a company we worked for a, bunch, a couple of years ago did. Um, so you have a client, you have a description for the project, and you have a bunch of latest action items or things that have happened to that project, and you have the staff members assigned to the project. So one thing you will do is the project name, like the, the field project, after a while, the user is very familiar with the fact that after the My Projects heading, there's going to be a list of project names. So we can gray out the word project, because it's not going to be as important. And we've... Uh, push the lists against each other and right aligned the, um, each of the labels. Because what we're actually interested in is everything past the label. So we want that to actually align against a common flush left border so we have this stuff aligned to the right. I don't know, does that make sense? Awesome, cool. Um, page, which is the grid. Uh, grids are really awesome. They give you more order and kind of specify where things should go so you know just arbitrarily stick them everywhere. Um, remember to put gutters, which are the margins between your columns. And uh, there are a bunch of rulers and ruler images that you can add to your website in development to just make this stuff easier. Um, they were popularized by Koivin on his website subtraction. 
So definitely worth checking out. And he wrote a really good blog post about it. So everything follows a grid, which is really cool. And there's, yeah, the whole bunch of grid um, scripts online that do all this stuff for you. Finally, don't use Comic Sans unless you have a very, very good reason. <laughs> um, if you are in need of a comic font, there's a really cool font called Comic Gens. I think it's Creative Commons license, and it's so much better than Comic Sans. And it has a whole bunch of really cool stuff in the font, so check it out. Um, see how Comic Gens. Again, the slides will be available. This is the book that you want to use if you're a massive type nerd. Um, I think it's about $30. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. I have a copy on me um, if you want to have a quick look later on. Finally, really cool people who are definitely worth checking out. I hope are these guys' names familiar to any of you. Yes, awesome. Um, John Tan is a really, really awesome guy to check out. His site is absolutely beautiful, so do check it out. There's resources and reading, a whole bunch of different things as well. And again, the slides will all be available, so I will put them up. And thank you very, very much. I'm sorry that it was so rushed, but again, the slides are all available, so if you're into this, check them out. Are there any questions, or is there even time for questions? We'll do five minutes. We've got a 15 minute break till the next okay, cool. session. Where are they available? Um, I will tweet them, and if you go to my website, if you look on SlideShare, I have an account with ClearPass as well, but I will just tweet it afterwards and. You can upload it to your session. Or I'll do that. Yeah, that sounds good. Cool. What are you going to do? Uh, upload them to the Drupal downunder.org website as the, under the session name, so just check that out. Um, when putting type together for a website, I honestly have never really thought, you, you just try and make it look good in general. It'd be interesting to know how many people really concentrate on their typefaces as they're doing it. Mm -hmm. So... Do you know? Does, any, does anyone here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah okay, I better, I better start thinking about it. Hi, my name's Russ. Um, actually, one of the reasons I came is, and this is a statement, not really a question, is that typography has an amazing effect on the ability of us uh, to influence a sale. So if you're doing um, a website that's selling something, typography is critical. And it's the other thing is about um, intelligibility, and so it has a dramatic effect on it. So if you get that right, you can dramatically affect the sales through flow through for your business. Yep. It's amazing. Yeah. I agree. I've got a quick question, if you don't mind. Is there a f um, how is font how are fonts managed through Drupal? It's not done through Media, I assume. Do you put them into sites default files, or is there? Yep. Yeah. So there are a bunch of other plugins that have existed for a while, if I remember, if I recall correctly, that manage fonts. Um, the other way was literally through the theme, so you had to go into the CSS to edit them, um, and to a certain extent, the at font your face, oh, font your face, yeah. Um, plugin now manages it. Um, I remember when I went through the slides much earlier, I listed all the various ways that you can get type online, uh, which was this slide here. So these are all the options you have. At font, uh, the font uh, your face takes care of all of these. Actually, it takes care of the installed ones as well, which are the ones that you, your user will have installed on their system. These two should no longer be used. So it does everything you really want. Yeah, nice. so Drupal has that plug-in, which is great. I, I quite like the look of a drop cap at the top of a page. Are there some rules and regulations about <coughs> the usage of drop caps? Um, sort of, yes. Um, most of them are in terms of you stick the drop cap to a scale as well. So um, you might have your main body in, in point 14 type, but then you don't arbitrarily <coughs> size the drop cap. You would size that to a scale as well. Um, I referenced some of the example whoops, pages. I think I have an internet connection. Apparently, I do not. Do I? There we go. So this is, this is the drop cap I'm using on my site. Um, you can do it in standards-based ways, in pure CSS, without using images or doing something really funky. It's a bit annoying. It takes a lot of fiddling. And I don't know it's not rendering at the moment. John Tangerine, he has 
and I've referenced some of the, the links in examples for like paragraph management, that page will have a bunch of drop caps. So it'll have a bunch of styles. So like for example, um, the drop cap will sit, rather than sitting outdented, the drop cap will sit here and everything will flow around it. Yeah. So, so I, was just, hey. I was just wondering, um, when you're visualizing or doing a layout mock-up for a site in say Photoshop, uh, to what extent would you try and get those fonts in and uh, actually test out how you want to lay it out on the actual site? And perhaps, uh, can you do all of that in Photoshop or is it, is it probably best just to wait till you get mostly to uh, the page and start writing the CSS and go from there and just sort of see sort of more organic type workflow? Yep. So I guess as an answer, it depends on what kind of a designer you are. I really like ditching Photoshop as early as possible or entirely. Um, yeah, I like doing my sites from like a sketch as a general layout of what I'm after and then I'll jump straight into CSS and XHTML. Um, if you are doing it and prototyping or like designing the site, the aesthetics of the design in, I don't know, in, in like Photoshop or Inkscape or GIMP or whatever, I, I would recommend you use the typefaces that you intend to use right then and there because the typography of the site I think is integral. It's like one of the most, it's as integral as the design itself in that sense. So you might put like Arial or Times New Roman even though you don't ever intend to use that in your final production version, then you get to the production version, you get your fonts that you actually want in and then you realize it really doesn't work at all. Like the typeface you're using doesn't work with any of the imagery you have or whatever, yeah, so use them right from the start. You might have to call it. Everyone, please thank Simon for the awesome talk. <laughs>